Thank you, friends. If you have your Bibles, I'd invite you to turn with me to Romans chapter 1. I can't take credit for the topic that I've been assigned this afternoon, but I do want to compliment the folks who chose it. Uh, I want to suggest to you that it is significant for us to discuss as a subject the God of the New Age movement for at least two reasons. One is New Age thinking, or to use the more correct term, neo-paganism, pervades our culture. Many, many of the leading uh, intellects of our time in the Western world have bought into neo-paganism, wittingly or unwittingly. They may not realize that they are neo-pagan in their thinking, but they are. Some of them do realize that they are neo-pagan, and they are neo-pagan with a vengeance. And so you need to know what a, new, a neo-pagan looks like and what a neo-pagan thinks about God. It's also important, not only because of the cultural impact of New Age thinking or neo-paganism, but it's important because it's impacting the church. The church's theology is being impinged upon by New Age thinking in some surprising areas. And again, to be alert Christians who discern truth from falsehood, who remain biblical in their thinking as opposed to capitulating to the prevailing thought views of the world, we need to know a little bit about the New Age. And of course, the specific focus of this talk is on the God of the New Age. But I want to give some general background and then look at the specifics. In fact, today, what I would like to do is four things. I would like to talk about the New Age movement and give some sort of a definition of what constitutes New Age thinking or neo-pagan thinking. Secondly, I would like to talk about the leading characteristics of New Age thinking. Thirdly, I would like to ask the question and answer, what is the God of the New Age like? And then fourthly, I'd like to suggest how we ought to respond to that. Now, we're going to do all of that somehow in the next 32 minutes, so buckle your seatbelts. If you have your Bibles open to Romans 1, I would direct your attention to just one verse, the 25th verse, and to just one part of that 25th verse in which Paul says, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator. I can't think of a better, a better Bible verse to describe the New Age than that. They worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator. Let's pray. Lord God, we bow before you and we acknowledge you as the creator of heaven and earth, as we begin to think about a view of life that does not acknowledge you as creator of heaven and earth, we ask that you would give us spiritual discernment, that you would, by your Holy Spirit, convict us and grow us more deeply in our understanding of the truth of your word, shape our thinking, our believing, our living in accordance with your truth. Help us to live for your glory, for we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. What is the New Age? When we talk about the God of the New Age as an idol, what do we mean by the New Age? Well, let me just say that a better term perhaps for New Age, certainly the term that's being used in uh, the more cutting-edge circles is neo-paganism. If we wanted to use a philosophical term to describe New Age thinking or a New Age worldview, we might use yet another term, monism, M-O-N-I-S-M, -S literally one-ism. Now, my guess is many of you have already been introduced to the New Age whether you realize it or not. Many of you, of course, are vaguely aware of the New Age movement. Perhaps some of you have read books that have attempted to alert Christians to the encroachment of New Age thinking in our culture and in the church. But some of you may not be aware of how long and how 
uh, popular this infusion of New Age thinking in a Western culture is. The Beatles were importing what has become characterized as New Age or neo-pagan thought all the way back in the 60s. I can't imagine a better theme song for the New Age than John Lennon's Imagine. Go back and look at those words sometimes. It gives you a beautiful outline of the agenda of neo-paganism. Earth, Wind, and Fire. A pop group in the 1970s and 80s was incorporating New Age thinking into their lyrics and to their concerts long before New Age was cool. Many of you may have remembered the books that Shirley MacLaine began authoring in the 1970s and 80s where she articulated her New Age philosophy. Some of you are television watchers and you've seen Dharma and Greg. And Dharma comes from a family deeply committed to New Age theology. Some of you were angered when you found out that mainline Protestant churches were participating in the sponsoring of a conference in Minneapolis, Minnesota, in which Sophia was worshipped by a gathering of Christians. And many of you have wandered into your local bookstore, and you've noticed that in the religion section, there's very little Christianity, but a lot of neo-paganism. And there may even be a section in that bookstore called New Age. You have run into New Age in a lot of places, is my guess. And I'm not sure that I can say this in Orlando, but Walt Disney has introduced you to a lot of New Age. If you've seen The Lion King, you have seen a beautiful, compelling articulation of the New Age worldview. If you've seen Pocahontas, you've seen a beautiful and compelling articulation of the New Age worldview, or more recently, Brother Bear. All of these films have incorporated into them a New Age worldview. If we could go back out to Hollywood, Star Wars, in its original trilogy and in all that continues, articulates a worldview which George Lucas deliberately based upon Eastern mysticism, Buddhism, and other forms of neo-paganism. You have run into the New Age movement. But what is it? What does the New Age movement believe? What is the worldview of the New Age movement? Well, if New Age or neo-pagan thought is monism, as I've already suggested in discussing different terms, then it probably ought to have only one point, shouldn't it? But I want to give you the five points of monism. I mean, we are, there are a lot of Calvinists here. That would be a good thing to do, to do the five points of monism, wouldn't it? It gives us an opportunity to respond. The first point of monism is that all is one. Maybe you remember your world religion class back in liberal arts college when you were trying to get your head around Hinduism and other forms of Eastern thought, and you heard your professor say, Atman is Brahman. Now, if you didn't hear your professor say that, don't worry about it. It's not going to affect anything else that happens today. But that beautifully expresses the theme of New Age thinking, all is one. Reality is essentially one, and we are all part of the reality, and the illusion is, according to New Age thinking, that there are real distinctions. There are no real distinctions. We are all part of one grand circle of life. We're all part of one great reality. That's why God is in us and we are in God, because we're all connected. And the only people spoiling that party are the people who continue to insist that distinctions are actually reflective of reality. And that, of course, means, among others, Christians who think that distinctions are pretty important. So the New Age movement wants to say all is one. Everything is part of the one reality that is. And only those who continue to insist that distinctions are real are mucking up the party. Secondly, monism, neo-paganism, teaches that humanity is one. And any distinctions in, within humanity 
do not reflect the great reality that all is one. Because all is one, humanity is one, and there are no real distinctions and differences within humanity, only sameness, equality, and oneness. You've heard the quip that there are two types of people in the world. Those who believe there are two types of people in the world and those who don't. Don't try and sort that one out. <clears throat> but it does reflect the reality in the college scene today here in America where professors are radically committed to a program of tolerance which is based on the idea that there are no real distinctions in humanity. Christians have a program for tolerance. By the way, we invented it in the Western world. And it is very different than that program for tolerance. Thirdly, monism says that all religions are one. All religions are part of or different aspects of the one reality. They all look at truth from a different perspective and they are a part of the grand whole of the one. And again, the only people messing up the party are those religionists who continue to insist that they are the only ones who know true truth. Once we realize that all is one, we recognize that everyone is part of this grand religious reality. Fourthly, humanity's problem, according to the New Age, is not sin. Humanity's problem is spiritual ignorance of our oneness. We haven't realized that we are all part of the one divine circle of life. And if we could only come to realize that, all of the problems would be solved in this world. So all is one. Humanity is one. All religions are one. And humanity's problem is not sin, but spiritual ignorance of our oneness. Shirley MacLaine expressed it in her books when she explained to us that she had finally discovered that she was God. The rest of us were disconcerted by this. But we may have misunderstood her because she thinks you're God too. And we're all God because humanity's problem is not sin or alienation from the Creator but ignorance of the fact that we are all part of the one. And fifthly, since our problem isn't sin, humanity's salvation isn't by redemption, but it's through looking within and discovering the reality that we are all part of the great oneness. These five points of monism undergird a worldview which is challenging Christianity in our day and time. So that's a little bit about what the New Age is. Now, what are the leading characteristics of the New Age? That's the second thing I want to do with you in the few moments that we have. What are the core values of a neo-pagan, monistic, New Age-influenced worldview? Well, here are just a few, 13 of them. I could have done more, but I'm being nice to you today. One, one of the core values of neo-paganism, maybe the most important core value of neo-paganism, is the denial of the creator-creature distinction. You see, in neo-paganism, the world is divine and all part of the one reality that is. And so the world is viewed as self-created, self-generating, and all part of that process which is essentially one. And so the idea of a transcendent creator who is over, above, and apart from his creation introduces, horror of horrors, a distinction into reality. a distinction between the infinite and the finite, a distinction between the eternal and the temporal, a distinction between the sovereign and the subject, a distinction between the one who made us and the one to whom we owe allegiance. And New Age is very concerned 
to eradicate that distinction. It is essential to their program. Now think for a few moments. What doctrine has been under the greatest assault in Western culture for the last 150 years? The doctrine of the transcendent creator God. There is a reason for that. Because there is a new worldview that wants to nudge its way onto the scene and until it gets rid of that little problem of the transcendent creator God, it cannot stand. Until we get the distinction of creature and creator out of our minds, the new, the new age, the neo-pagan worldview cannot have its way. So first and foremost, first core value is the denial of the creator-creature distinction. Second core value of new age thinking is that man is divine as a part of the sum total of the one. And the one is divine, and so man self-actualizes by realizing that he's part of the one and realizing that he's divine. He looks within for salvation. He looks for a remembrance of who he really is, part of this great one reality. Now, my friends, this kind of thinking isn't just the kind of stuff that you see on late-night infomercials starring Tony Robbins, who's encouraging you to discover the giant within you. This kind of thinking is being pandered by evangelical Christians. When I was with R.C. in... October or November in Houston. can't remember exactly when it was. October and November in Houston. Uh, on the way from the airport to the complex where the conference was being held, there was a ginormous billboard. And on that billboard, which was sponsored by a ginormous evangelical church, were the words, Discover the Champion Within You. And I thought to myself, well, isn't that wonderful? A Christian church pro-promoting neo-paganism, just what we need. Now, they didn't realize it, perhaps, but they had beautifully encapsulated the salvific dream of the New Age movement. Unfortunately, they were confused. They thought that they were telling you a Christian story. It wasn't, though. Salvation isn't by looking within and discovering the champion within you. Thirdly, third core value or leading characteristic of neo-paganism is that distinctions between animals and humans must be eliminated. You thought that racism was the big problem. The New Ager says, no, no, it's worse than that. Speciesism is a problem. We humans have dared to think that we're different than or above animals. But all is one. And do you see this thinking underneath not only the modern ecology movement, but also under the various animal rights movements? Fourthly, neo-paganism says there is no right and wrong. All is relative. Sin and guilt and evil are illusions. I'm not going to go far down that track because R.C. Jr. is going to talk to you about relativism today, but New Agers can embrace that part of the God of the relativist because all is one and good and evil are illusions. Fifthly, the New Age movement, neo-paganism, says that death and life are all part of the great circle of life. Death is not the final enemy. Death is not the punishment of sin. Death and life are all part of the great cycle of reality. You've heard this before. Remember Forrest Gump? Dying's just part of living, his mother used to tell him. That is not the Christian view of death. The Christian view of death is that it, that is not how it was supposed to be. And that Adam and Eve's sin introduced something that was not supposed to be in this world and that Jesus' death has dealt a death blow to something that ought not to be and will not be in that new reality of the new heavens and the new earth that will be ushered in in the coming of Christ again. 
but for the new age. Life and death, it's all part of the one cycle of life in reality. There's not a heaven or a hell. That's a sixth core value of neo-paganism. There's no heaven, no hell. All is one. Hell is just the projection of our judgmentalism. John Lennon asked you to imagine there's no heaven, no hell below. He beautifully summarizes that neo-pagan thought. Seventh, sin and holiness are just Western constructs. We need to talk about wholeness, not holiness, the monist says. Eighth, the Bible is just like other scriptures. All religious truth is one and the same. How has that particular view of the New Age movement impacted us? Well, it's impacted us in a number of ways. For instance, some of you are aware of the Jesus Seminar and its work on the Gospels. And you know that the Jesus Seminar has produced a Bible with five Gospels in it. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Thomas. Thomas, you say. I've never heard of Thomas before. That's right. It's a late second century Gnostic Gospel. Nobody, nobody in the history of Christianity, not Protestant, not Orthodox, not Catholic, has ever acknowledged the Gospel of Thomas to be part of the canon of Scripture. But interestingly, in the Jesus Bible, Surprise, surprise, which gospel is most authentic? No, not John. No, not Luke. No, not Matthew. No, not Mark. In fact, I can quote all of the gospel of Mark according to the Jesus Bible. Are you ready for it? This is the only part of the gospel of Mark that is actually spoken by Jesus according to the Jesus Bible. Are you ready for it? Here it is. I'm going to quote to you the whole gospel of Mark. Render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's. Wouldn't you know that liberals would reduce the gospel to pay your taxes? <laughs> That's it. But the gospel of Thomas, this Gnostic gospel, it's very authentic. What's happening? Again, the idea that all scriptures represent part of the grand truth of the one. Ninth, there is no distinction between orthodoxy and heresy. Many of you have never picked up a book by a high-powered academic like Bart Ehrman from the University of North Carolina in his book, Lost Christianities, where he attempts to articulate these kinds of Christianities which have been squelched by orthodoxies in the past. Many of you have never picked up that kind of book, and by the way, you don't need to, but many of you have never picked up that kind of book, have picked up Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code. And you've wondered if there was a secret plot to squelch a particular view of Christianity that was predominant in the days of the early church. There wasn't, by the way, and that book is not only bad, it's just fiction. But where are those ideas coming from? This is a time-honored neo-pagan idea. There's no distinction between orthodoxy and heresy. Tenth, there's no distinction between Christianity and paganism. Elaine Pagels, a very famous scholar, has done much to articulate the need for Gnostic thinking in our day and time and to attempt to eradicate the distinctions between historic Christianity and paganism. That is part of a neo-pagan, a new age agenda. Eleventh, there are no distinctions between male and female. Distinctions are bad. Distinctions are out for the neo-pagan. And so we see in most of the forms of egalitarian outside the church and inside the church, most of the forms of egalitarian teaching that want to eradicate role relationships that have been structured by the Bible in the home and in the church, we see under and behind them neo-pagan thinking. Twelfth, neo-paganism says there should be no traditionally defined family. All kinds of families are good. Heard anything about that recently? Well, that's a good New Age neo-pagan thought. Again, remember, distinctions are bad. Who are we to say that a man and a woman is a traditional family? Why not a man and four women? Or a man and a man? Who are we to make the distinction? 
to say that one is good and one is bad. This is a neo-pagan idea. And 13th, the neo-pagan even wants to make it clear that there should be no difference between parents and children. Who, who should think that parents have the authority in the first place and the responsibility in the second of training and nurturing and disciplining their children? The debate in Sweden today is not about how a parent should discipline a child. They're way beyond the issue of spanking. The issue in Sweden is whether a child should be disciplined at all by a parent. It's coming to a country near you, neo-paganism, and these are some of its core values. Now let me suggest this, all of this, all of these core values require and therefore create the necessity for a very different kind of God than the God of the Bible. You can't have these core values and still have the God of the Bible. You need a different kind of God in order to uphold these core values. And so that's the third place I'd like to go with you, simply asking and answering the question, what is the God of the New Age like? First of all, the God of the New Age is not the creator. He did not speak the world into being. He is not distinct from the world. He is not transcendent above the world. The world is not accountable to him, responsible to him, utterly dependent upon him, contingent to him. No, the God of the New Age is not the transcendent, personal, creator God of the Old Testament and of the New Testament, of Christianity. The God of neo-paganism is a spiritual force, part and parcel of the totality of this one in which we exist. And so... New Age thinking, neo-pagan thinking, prefers to come up with different terminology to talk about God rather than appealing to the old, authoritarian, patriarchal images of God that have been used from time immemorial in the Christian tradition. One of those terms that is used to apply to the New Age God is Sophia. Perfectly good word in and of itself. It just means wisdom. But Sophia is personified in a female form. The reason, of course, is a revolt against the idea of authority. And since males have had authority in the power structures of the world, you choose an anti-authority figure to show the overthrowing of the old order. And Sophia is not a transcendent God. She is a creator spirit that pervades and suffuses reality. You don't think of God speaking the world into being in the world in, anymore. You think of God birthing the world into being. Sophia, you see, is a goddess of process. She is always becoming. The world is always becoming. Evolution is the process whereby the world is becoming. And one of Sophia's names or faces is Gaia, Mother Earth. And so we see earth worship and a mother goddess worship pervading even in some Christian circles. Because God is not the transcendent creator God who made heaven and earth, we also must recognize, according to the New Age, that we are God and God is in us. The title that was given to this talk by the Ligonier staff is good. You are God beautifully summarizes the message of the New Age movement. Not that you are replacing the transcendent God. There is no such God like that, according to the New Age but that you are God in the sense that you are part of this grand oneness in which there is no distinction. Now, over against these pagan notions, the Bible articulates a robust truth about who God is, and I want to point you to two places in particular that do this. If you'll turn first to Genesis chapter 1, 
Moses had some pagans to deal with in his day. And those pagans were sun worshipers. And those sun worshipers worshipped the sun, not because they were stupid, but because they realized that without the sun, there would be no life. The sun was necessary for all life. These were smart people. They understood that. But what they did is the key mistake of idolatry. They absolutized the relative. They exalted the creature above the one who created the creature. And so they worshipped the sun, recognizing the sun as the source of all life. As Moses gives his account of creation in Genesis 1. Allow your eyes to scan from verse 1. Tell me where in verses 1 through 13, the first three days of creation described, where in verses 1 through 13 does Moses talk about the sun? Nowhere. Oh, he talks about light, but there's no sun. What's Moses reminding these people? That God is sovereign above the sun. If he wants light, he can do it without the sun. The sun is not absolute. The transcendent creator God is absolute. If he wants to give light, he can do it without the sun. We don't worship the sun. We worship the God who made the sun. Moses is saying this in Egypt where they worship the sun. Ra was his name there. He's saying that, can you imagine slaves huddled around? And they've been hearing about Ra from their Egyptian masters. They've seen their Egyptian masters worship the sun god Ra. And Moses says, let me tell you about who made the sun. He's the same God who's going to bring you out of this place. He's the transcendent God. And you see how Moses used the biblical truth of the transcendent personal creator God to destroy the idol, the false God of the Mediterranean world in his own day. And see, that same truth is a truth which we must understand and proclaim over against the false teaching of neo-paganism. Neo-paganism that wants to deny that distinction needs to be confronted with the challenge of the reality of the personal transcendent creator God. One of my favorite books on sharing the gospel is Will Metzger's Tell the Truth. And in his outline for sharing the gospel, do you know where he starts? He doesn't start with man. He doesn't start with our needs. He starts with the transcendent creator God because the gospel doesn't make sense if that reality is not understood and embraced. And in a culture which more and more rejects that reality, we must not fail to address that in our gospel witness. Now, interestingly, Paul, if you'll turn forward with me to Acts chapter 17 also realized this very important point. And so when he was amongst the smartest pagans of his day in Athens, Greece, in Acts chapter 17, verse 24, had the opportunity to share the gospel with them. Where does he start? Acts chapter 17, look at verse 23, while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. What therefore you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. You see where Paul starts? With the doctrine of the transcendent personal creator God. Why is that doctrine so important? Because if God made you, you are obligated to him. And if you have rebelled against his rule, consciously or unconsciously, been indifferent to his lordship, you are in rebellion against the one who made you. It's the starting point 
to understand sin and grace, the transcendent creator God. And we as Christians must articulate this biblical truth in response to the neo-pagan worldview. And I only have a few minutes left, so let me go on to the fourth point. How are we to respond then? In light of this biblical truth, how are we to respond to the God of the new age, which is essentially a God from whom the transcendent, personal lordship ascribed to God in the Bible has been stripped away? Well, the first thing that I would suggest that you need to do is read. There's some good books in the bookstore here that will help you in this regard. But let me suggest three or four books that may be of great assistance to you. And they're all by a friend of Ligonier Ministries, a man named Peter Jones. Peter Jones has written four books that are very helpful. A couple of them uh, have been endorsed by R.C. Sproul, who I think some of you may know a little about. Peter Jones' first book, The Gnostic Empire Strikes Back. Yep, it's based on the Star Wars theme. The Gnostic Empire Strikes Back catalogs the introduction of this kind of thinking into our churches and culture. His second book, Spirit Wars, takes you a little deeper. His third book, Gospel Truth and Pagan Lies, is something that you could put in the hands of a high school student. And in the course of a 20-minute reading of that short book, they'd have a good handle on the main points of neo-paganism. And then his most recent book, Capturing the Pagan Mind, all address the issue of New Age thinking very, very helpfully. The second thing that I would like to ask you to do in response to the New Age uh, worldview, neo-pagan thinking, the neo-pagan view of God, is to think biblically. Turn back to Romans chapter 12. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1, the apostle says this, I urge you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Paul's saying that he doesn't want them to think and live like pagans. He wants them to think and live like Christians. Isn't there a radio program called Renewing Your Mind? Do it. Thirdly, pray. Paul says in Ephesians 6, verse 12, that we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but with powers and principalities. And he then goes on to exhort us to pray at all times. There are going to be times of prayer during this conference. Archie Parrish is going to help lead them. This would be a good time now to commit yourself to praying for the kingdom because the kingdom is waging a mighty war right now. The gates of hell are seeking to prevail against it. They will not. But we must pray that God's kingdom would prevail. Fourthly, be on the lookout for Christian compromise with pagan thinking. It's everywhere. And fifthly, graciously and lovingly, but faithfully and uncompromisingly, live and tell the truth that we are not God. You know, one of the first principles of theology is to learn this truth. There is a God, and I am not him. And neo-paganism wants to confuse the world on that very, very important first principle of theology. And as Christians, we should not give in on that very, very important point. May God bless you.